Huh, what do you know? It is flat. Oh, never mind. Immersive Sim is a term that was coined by game designers Warren Spector and Doug Church to describe a specific kind of game. Generally, an immersive sim is a game in which the player finds themselves in an open-ended environment with a set of objectives that encourage exploration and creative problem-solving. The player can choose to take an aggressive approach, smooth-talk their way past some guards, or hunt down a ventilation shaft that is always conveniently large enough to support an adult human. This is a classic example, but there are many ways in which this subgenre encourages experimentation and rewards those creative enough to break the game's rules. Now, if you're watching a review for Weird West, you're probably already aware of this, but I always assumed the first-person perspective was a necessary component for an immersive sim. But according to my crack team of intellectuals at Reddit, this is not the case. I'm willing to accept this. Reluctantly. When you expand useful terms too much, they stop being useful. Is Metal Gear Solid an immersive sim? We've managed to avoid drowning! However you choose to look at it, Weird West is theoretically an immersive sim, and the debut game of Wolf Eye Studios, founded by Raphael Colantonio, a name you might be familiar with if you're a fan of immersive sims. Yeah, he created Dishonored, and don't get me wrong, that's a great game, but more importantly, he directed Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. and Arx Fatalis. And I hate the Communicatum rune. I cannot do it. I, I still cannot do it. It takes me forever to do this one. This is actually one of the few times where I really hate the magic system. Neither of these games, despite being great, sold very well, so he's really the harbinger of cult hits, and that rings true with Weird West. The game is presented in a top-down view, which kind of frames it in such a way that you might think it's an RPG. Dispensing with the term immersive sim, which I've already said so much it's losing its meaning, it's really a stealth action game with some light RPG elements. The story is presented in a unique way, with you taking control of five different characters over the course of the game. More on them later. Graphically, the game looks fine. It uses that telltale art style where the environmental details are suggested through texture work rather than modeled out, and it's all cell shaded. It always makes me think of a scanner darkly. I don't dislike this art style, but I do think it looks better with a more vibrant color palette, which you're not going to be finding in the American Southwest. I will say they absolutely nailed it with the user interface. Everything from the beautifully illustrated world map to the Dishonored style character portraits, even down to the font and color choices, perfectly serve this game's look and feel. There's a nice attention to detail paid to all of the little flourishes, like the way the ground folds up into a paper map at the edge of a location. On the topic of presentation, the soundtrack is great. There's a real combination of traditional and non-traditional. Some of the dark ambience that plays while you're sneaking around a cave evokes Eric Brosius' work on the Thief series, and that's a compliment I don't give out lightly. The sound design in general has a real attention to detail. Of course, the guns sound nice and juicy, as it should be. But even the sound of a candle being blown out or a glass bottle being knocked around enhanced the immersion in a way that most top-down games fail to do. There's almost no voice acting outside of a narrator. Pistol's grip matches your palm exactly. That probably bothers some people, but voice acting is never high on my priority list. Rather, the game does a sort of banjo and kazooie thing where characters make weird mumble noises. Weird West opens with our first of five protagonists, an ex-bounty hunter named Jane Bell watching kidnappers take her husband and kill her son. Damn, that's one way to start a game. So the player takes control and Jane dusts off her old revolvers. For some reason, the mouse control when looking around never felt quite right to me. I don't know if there's some kind of mouse acceleration going on, but the game has difficulty reading small movements. It's never a problem when aiming the gun proper, but it's a minor annoyance that stuck with me until the end. The controls in general are a bit unwieldy to get the hang of. It probably took me about five or so hours of playing until I actually felt comfortable with the control and interface. But when I finally did, it felt good to play. 
In combat, you're given a fair number of tools to cause mayhem. There are five weapon types, melee, pistol, rifle, shotgun, and bow. There are also some throwables like dynamite, cluster dynamite, and electric dynamite. Melee sucks. You can stand there attacking another character and whiff so much you'll think you're playing Morrowind. <laughs> Melee weapons already require you to put yourself in harm's way, so the fact that enemies can actually dodge your attacks means melee is essentially useless. Shotguns serve the same purpose anyway, being a high-risk, high-reward, close-range option, but your shots actually connect. A pistol is usually a solid option in any situation, dishing out fair damage with decent fire rates. The bow is the most silent option. A bow takedown is always the most silent way to eliminate resistance. But the firing rate is low and the damage isn't that great, so you better kill what you're aiming at. And then there's the rifle. I held the rifle close to my heart in the beginning, but I have to admit it can trivialize the game a bit. Like Dishonored, progression exists in the form of character abilities which influence the way you play the game and require you to spend action points to use. These can be replenished with invigorating tonics. The first ability I unlocked made rifle shots silent and increased their damage by 200%, and with that I was taking out entire enemy outposts from a single vantage point. After a while, I bumped the difficulty up from normal to hard, which made the strategy a little less viable. The next ability I got was an upgraded kick. Since this game is directed by the guy who handled Dark Messiah, I assumed the kick would be awesome. It's not, though. It's worth mentioning that difficulty actually affects things like how quickly an enemy can detect you, their fire rate, and whether or not sleeping heals your character, rather than just raw damage output. Top-down shooters usually run into problems when aiming from varying elevations, but Weird West has a really elegant solution to this problem. If an enemy or environmental object sits between the aiming reticle and your character, the game will automatically prioritize that as a target, whether it's above or below you. The only times I missed a shot or shot the wrong target, it was entirely my own fault. So I think Wolfeye deserves some commendation for making such an intuitive system. The combat in general has its ups and downs depending on the environment you're in and how willing the AI is to cooperate, but when it's on, it's on. And that's because on top of your abilities, there's also a dodge roll that slows down time, Max Payne style. This dodge roll is the rug that really ties the room together, and it makes for some badass moments in combat. The battlefields here are often littered with hazardous objects that can be electrocuted, exploded, or dropped on unsuspecting enemies to make for some satisfying mayhem. It never approaches the depth or variety of the Divinity games. That is to say, you can't stab someone to create a blood pool, light a fire on the blood to create blood steam, and then throw a thunder grenade into the steam to create an electrified blood cloud and then teleport the blood cloud over to an enemy to kill them but it pays to stop and look around at your surroundings before jumping in. If you're covered in oil, you'll take more fire damage. If it's raining, you'll take less fire damage. Also, these rain barrels you can drink from refill. That's cool. Unfortunately, some of the environmental hazards can create moments of such unfettered chaos that I sometimes literally had no idea what was going on. The fights can become so cluttered with enemies, allies, house fires, and bees oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! that you have to take a step back and let the dust clear before proceeding, during which time your allies can die. I don't care how advanced games become, seeing an enemy casually stroll next to a TNT barrel is a joyous occasion. Now, this mayhem can be avoided altogether, given that stealth is a perfectly viable option here. Because this is a top-down game, you have a perfect view of the battlefield, and as a result, you're not getting the same nail-biting tension of a thief game, nor the depth of Metal Gear Solid V but it's serviceable. It works using a simple vision cone based system. You sneak around trying to avoid making noise and just choke enemies out. You can try to go for a melee kill, but I don't recommend it. The enemies, and I'm not kidding here, can dodge your stealth melee attacks. If an enemy discovers the body of a friend, they and all nearby enemies will be put on a high alert status, making sneaking tougher. If they discover you, well, you blew it, big guy. As far as I can tell, you can ghost most of the levels too, avoiding any kind of enemy interaction altogether, but you're gonna miss out on valuable loot. The best thing about the stealth system is a strength Weird West shares with Dishonored, which is that the combat is actually fun and engaging enough that getting caught doesn't feel like such a terrible punishment. In so many of these immersive sim games, combat is so stiff, unfun, or punishing that if you play long enough, you'll evolve another finger, specifically to hit the quick save and quick load buttons. Interestingly enough, the game actually encourages you via a tutorial to quick save and quick load often, telling you to experiment, which I appreciate. 
So the game is pseudo open world, broken up into self-contained zones which are separated by a world map like the original Fallout games. And like Fallout, you can encounter random events on your way to a destination. Most of these are simple combat encounters, but occasionally you'll find a merchant selling special items or the odd setup for a quest. By the end of the game, you'll have seen every single encounter about five times, so the game mercifully allows you to skip them after seeing them once per character. In the beginning, I was surprised by how brutal some of these encounters were. I was totally unprepared and got decimated a number of times. As far as individual zones go, all I can say is don't expect any levels with the complexity of the Jindosh Mansion from Dishonored, or hubs as expansive and detailed as Santa Monica from Vampire Bloodlines. After beating the game, I'm confident saying this is one of Weird West's weaknesses, the environmental design. In the beginning, I'd been conditioned by other top-down games to stay focused on the X and Z axis, but after realizing there was an element of verticality to the game, I was excited for the possibilities of the level design. At the core of immersive sim design is this ethos. Let me, the player, come up with a solution to a problem. Give me the tools to make that solution a reality, and then vindicate me and pat me on the head while telling me I'm a genius for thinking of it. Making it through a tough stealth section on Spotted or mowing down a town full of banditos are all great, but it's those moments where you feel genuinely clever that these games shine. Weird West just felt too restrictive in that regard. The powers can be fun in combat, but there's nothing so earth-shatteringly game-changing as the rope arrow from Thief. Ah yes, the rope arrow. Such a simple addition. Fire an arrow into wood, a rope extends down from the wood but it fundamentally changes your perspective of the game world. It guides your thinking in such a way that the experience goes from one of simple first-person navigation to a layer cake, dense with vertical possibilities. The blink ability from Dishonored is another example of this. There is no such thing in Weird West. At one point in the game, I came across an unbreakable locked door. I couldn't find the key, so I started gathering barrels in the area and constructed myself a tower. I climbed over the top and circumvented the door altogether. I got excited wondering what other situations the game had in store for me. But these opportunities are few and far between. More often than not, the most creative solution to a problem is barrel stacking. But in those moments where Weird West feels confident in letting the player break the guardrails and get creative is where I see the greatest unmet potential. You'll visit the same locations often, especially if you hunt down a lot of bounties like I did. I got to know Sterling Mine better than my own kitchen. Sometimes you'll return to a location and find that its occupants and layout have changed. Sometimes just a little, other times quite a bit. This is a great touch, and it can keep things fresh and exciting. Sadly, there are so many reused layouts and assets that the majority of locations in the game don't have any kind of identity. In my opinion, the best option here would have been focusing on a small number of locations, making sure each one feels unique and special, while packing it full of secrets and alternative routes. I will say that most locations make for fun playgrounds, making sure there's enough cover, rooftops, and TNT barrels to ever prevent you from getting bored on revisits. But it would have been nice to have less superfluous areas and more meaningful ones. Earlier I'd mentioned Weird West having some light RPG elements. First of all, this game is chock full of loot. Loot, loot, loot. Absolutely stuffed with loot. You may be excited to find a cigar box for the first time, but I have to warn you that they cannot be smoked. I mean, come on Wolf Eye, it's current year. Give us smokable stogies. We'll be showing you now how to smoke a cigarette and a cigar. First, you need to have a cigar. Loot comes in several varieties. First of all, there's equipment. Each weapon type has one or two variants, which can be taken and sold to a merchant in town or broken down and turned into ammunition. Or nuggets can be found from looting or mined from ore veins if you carry a pickaxe with you. These are used to upgrade weapons at a blacksmith, so they're a pretty valuable commodity, especially early on in the game. You can also melt them down into bars and sell them for quick cash. There are amulets, which have unique bonuses when equipped, usually increased resistances or damage boosts, and there are vests, which can be found on enemies or crafted at a tannery. In order to craft or upgrade a vest, you'll have to hunt down an animal and use a skinning kit to collect their hide. Finally, there's junk. Functionally, junk is just a visual representation of a dollar value. Sometimes junk is worth a little, sometimes junk is worth a lot. But all times, junk fills your inventory and forces you to offload it back in town before continuing. I understand why there's a limit to the junk you can carry. There's so much loot in this game, if you could pick it all up unrestricted, you'd probably become a millionaire in 10 minutes. But like the locations, my preference here would be quality over quantity. You might feel a bit exhausted from looting every container. You might think you can skip some, but nope. 
there might be an incredible item in a random barrel, so get looting, man. So there are a lot of little things that add some depth to Weird West's systems, but not a ton. I'm okay with this. I don't think Weird West has an obligation to be some kind of deep, complex RPG, nor do I think that being an RPG is inherently a good thing. If anything, a lot of these mechanics almost become a roadblock to having fun by the end of the game. I don't think it ever quite reaches that point, though. If nothing else, the RPG elements of this game provide just enough incentive to head off the beaten trail, do some exploration, and find some quests. And of all the games I've played with quests in them, Weird West is one of them. The side quests in Weird West are, for the most part, very simple, and many of them are procedurally generated. I wouldn't have a problem with this if the game did include a roster of high-quality side quests, but it really doesn't. Now don't get me wrong, there are a few quests that stand out. For example, there was one point where I was trying to find a wraith that haunted this town. I was given some vague instructions each step of the way, all without a quest marker, and I was starting to feel stumped when I heard strange noises while walking through town. I followed this audio cue before arriving at a boarded up abandoned house where the next stage of the quest took place. This approach to questing with a reliance on a player's observance is risky for a game developer to implement. Scripting out quests is hard work, knowing that a player may become frustrated and abandon the quest or not even come across it, thereby invalidating your hard work, requires having faith in the player. Oh, fuck this. That's why so many high-budget games just let you press X to use Hero Vision, which highlights quest items in red. I appreciate the Wraith quest a lot, and also wish the game had a lot more just like it. The vast majority of the time, side quests are bog standard. Go here, talk to, or kill this person, come back for reward, which is disappointing. However, when the game does let loose a bit with the complexity, there are usually sections that challenge the player's perception, as well as moral choices that can come back in unexpected ways. I hope that Wolf Eye finds some success so we can see what kind of creative quest design they're capable of under the right circumstances. I've already mentioned the abilities, which are purchased with a somewhat rare resource called Nymph Relics. There are also perks, which confer passive bonuses in exchange for Golden Ace of Spade cards. Abilities and equipment are reset with each new character campaign, while the perks you bought persist between characters. I think that there are pros and cons to this system. The good is that the game tacitly encourages variety. You may have committed to a pistol build with one character, but now you can try out a shotgun-focused playstyle without feeling a sunk cost. The bad is that with each new character, there's always some slog period in the beginning as you earn back the money you lost, re-upgrade the weapons you lost, and hunt down more nymph relics to bring your character up to snuff. This becomes pretty monotonous by the fifth character. The ugly is that by your fifth character, the game practically drip feeds you nymph relics to keep you happy, which greatly devalues nymph relics. This is a segue. In all of these modern immersive sims, there's a problem of balance. Dishonored, Prey, and the modern Deus Ex games all have their own version of nymph relics. Runes, Neuromods, and Praxis kits, respectively. These items are meant to represent the high point for loot, so they're often awarded for completing tasks, exploring, or following the main story. Ultimately, what this leads to is an overabundance of these items if you're the type of player to do as many side activities as possible. You end up purchasing abilities that don't really interest you, or at worst, you ignore the items altogether because they no longer represent an extrinsic motivation for you. This problem persists in Weird West, and it's made worse by the fact that most abilities don't even have the game-changing connotations that something in, say, Dishonored would have. Most abilities here boil down to damage increases, some kind of elemental bonus, or an area of effect attack. There are a few standouts that are a little cooler than the others, but generally speaking, most encounters can be dealt with pretty handily with just a dodge roll or sneaking. As for the perks, they can give you some pretty ludicrous bonuses when maxed out. Increasing your jump height by 50% or your ally's health by 80% are pretty significant, but the first level of these is usually something really uninteresting. 5% discount at a store? 10% increase in reload speed? Move 5% faster when aiming? That sucks, man. Who's gonna notice a 5% movement speed increase? The thing is, most of these perks actually do become more noticeable further down the chain, and the cost of each unlock level increases to reflect that. But there's nothing appealing about these at first glance. Prey had this system as well, but it was somewhat alleviated by showing you exactly what a commitment to one skill tree would net you without you having to invest in it. In Weird West, you just have to hope that an investment will pay off in the end. The five characters of Weird West are unique. You have Jane Bell, the bounty hunter out for revenge, Clerns Quig, the pig man. Okay, that got interesting quick. Across Rivers, the Native American bowman. Desi Rios, the werewolf. And lastly, Constance Driftwood, the Oniromancer, or witch if you prefer. So there you go, five spine-tingling tales of the macabre, a veritable who's who of outlandish characters replete with their own motivations, communities, and skill sets. 
I think this style of storytelling lands more often than it doesn't. Going in, I was expecting something like Creepshow, five stories told independently of each other. But as it turns out, there's a pretty strong connecting thread between them with a lot of crossover. Your current character can actually go find your previous characters and recruit them to your team, or kill them. The main story begins with a lot of ambiguity, but becomes more intriguing as you get more and more information. There are a few recurring characters who all seem to know something you don't, and they'd rather you figure it out on your own. Now, I gotta admit, I was skeptical at first. Thanks to Joss Whedon, every writer of an offbeat story feels compelled to write sarcastic, quippy, and insincere dialogue. But outside of a few kooky characters, Weird West steers clear of that direction. Even more impressive than that, it never gets pretentious either. Will you tell me what the hell is going on? Each character does have their own individual stories, and they range from compelling to a little on the bland side. Clern's Quig, the Pigman, was easily my favorite of the five characters. There's a mystery involved that instantly grabbed me, and I appreciated its themes of redemption and forgiveness. In the beginning, I had to sneak through town, avoided being spotted by the townsfolk, and I got real excited thinking, Awesome, this is gonna be like the Nosferatu campaign in Vampire Bloodlines. Damn, me! Don't be sneaking up on a brother with your crackhead skin disease test tube baby looking ass! But no, that's the only time you have to do that. Townsfolk do make comments about you being a pigman though, so I guess that's cool. Now, the developers made sure to involve real-life Anishinaabe to make sure the story of our Native American character across rivers was handled appropriately. But I was very disappointed to see lycanthrope culture being so brazenly mischaracterized in Desi's campaign. Wolfi, please consider having me as a consultant on your next project. Day's got his own leash he wears, and then there's the kind his mother keeps him tethered to. His family, his chores, his study. So there is some varying quality to the character stories, but they, along with the overarching narrative, remain mostly captivating. There is lore in Weird West, and though it is not the most robust I've seen in a game, there's a fair amount of world building in the form of books, letters, and conversations you can eavesdrop on. There's a small pantheon of gods that seem to affect the world in various ways, as well as different factions warring with each other. But Elder Scrolls, this is not. One highlight of the story is that each character offers you a new perspective, letting you experience what it's like to be a member of a faction that was previously hostile towards you. I think this idea has a lot of potential and is being held back by a weak supporting cast. Yeah, the supporting cast aren't the greatest, and by aren't the greatest I mean arguably don't exist. There are a few characters integral to the story, and outside of three or four if you're being generous, they're all throwaway, used for the express purpose of chugging the plot along with no real attention paid to their personality. Sometimes you can ask them a question and they'll respond, but usually they're just there to inform you of where you should go next, who you should talk to, or why you should do it. I don't want a bunch of flat video game characters. I want friends. Friends! Ultimately, what interested me the most wasn't the fate of any character, including the ones I actually played as, but rather figuring out what the hell was going on. The companions in this game are either copy-pasted mercenaries which can be hired in town, or characters from the previous journeys that can now be recruited. It's cool to hear a previously silent protagonist talk to your character, but outside of a line or two, there's no banter at all, which is a big disappointment. They're not companions so much as they're mobile meat shields that occasionally complain about the weather. Weird West delivers on its ending. It answers almost every question I had, and also took into account some decisions I made along the way, including decisions I didn't even know were decisions. And that's awesome. Morality tends to be a bit ham-fisted in some of these games, so I gotta give credit when developers weave it into the story organically. In the end, I felt the same sense of pride as beating New Vegas and seeing all the effects of my good deeds. The old Mormon fort quickly devolved into little more than a junky den. I clocked in about 25 hours with Weird West, and that's while doing every bit of side content I could find, not that I necessarily went hunting for more. I'd say that's a good length for this game. I was just starting to feel that little bit of eagerness to be done with it by the end. As of the release of this video, Weird West is $44 in Canada, $40 in the United States, and probably $699 in Australia. It could be worth the price depending on what your expectations are. If you're expecting a Dishonored or Fallout, maybe hang on to your cash and wait for a sale. If you're chomping at the bit for a solid, top-down shooter with open-ended design philosophy, then I say have at it. Wolfi Studios took a lot of risks making this game. Video game development is expensive. With production budgets climbing higher and the market becoming crowded, it's never been more important to support developers who take risks and make unorthodox design decisions. Weird West is far from perfect, but it's a hell of a debut game from developers who clearly put their heart and soul into their work.
Wow, you made it all the way to the end. Hey, I appreciate that. If you like this video and you're interested in hearing more, I ask you kindly, like the video, maybe subscribe if you're feeling bold, and hey, maybe even leave a comment. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Let's argue on the internet together. I've got a lot of ideas for more modern reviews as well as some for classic games as well, so stay tuned and thanks for watching.